Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Kowalski, and I work in the Educational Department at NORD. I'll be your host for today's webinar about rare cancers, sex, challenges, and patient stories. Thanks to everyone online for joining us. Uh, we have an incredible group of speakers today on Rare Cancer Day 2019. The purpose of Rare Cancer Day is to highlight the challenges that people living with rare cancers face, to unify individuals living with rare cancer, and to raise awareness of rare cancers and the need for more research and patient support. Today's webinar is part of our cost-free series of educational webinars for patients and caregivers. We're glad you're with us today, and we hope you'll join us for future webinars. So I'd like to take a moment to briefly introduce NORD for any of you who may not be familiar with us. We are an independent organization that's leading the fight to improve the lives of those with rare diseases. And we do this through education, research, um, advocacy, and our patient services. You can learn more about NORD's programs, services, and resources on our website at rarediseases.org. You can also follow NORD on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And now I would like to introduce our speakers. Jim Palma is co-chairman of NORD's Rare Cancer Coalition and the executive director of Target Cancer Foundation. This nationally recognized foundation supports comprehensive rare cancer research programs and patient support services. John Hopper is the co-chairman of NORD's Rare Cancer Coalition, co-chair of GI Cancers Alliance, which is the world's largest patient-focused foundation for GI cancers, and president of the Fibrolamellar Cancer Foundation. Carol DeSantis is a cancer epidemiologist and principal scientist in the Surveillance and Health Services Research Program at the American Center, uh, Cancer Society. She's recently authored in-depth reports on rare cancers in adults. Ms. DeSantis has authored more than 40 peer-reviewed publications and several book chapters. Kristen Anthony is a two-time cancer survivor and president and founder of the P10 Hamartoma Tumor Syndrome Foundation, working to raise funds to, uh, for research and to educate the public about P10 Hamartoma Tumor Syndrome and the lack of research funding for this rare disease. And Nicholas Lindeback is a brave 10-year-old diagnosed with type 2 neurofibromytosis. His first symptoms occurred at age 3. Since his diagnosis, Nicholas underwent three major surgeries. He's recovering currently from brain surgery and has begun six weeks of daily radiation treatments. Nicholas has kindly agreed to share his story with us today. So we're thrilled to have all of you here today, and without further ado, let me present Mr. Jim Palma. Thanks very much. Um, glad to be here today. Um, my name is Jim Palma, and I'm the Executive Director of Target Cancer Foundation, which is a rare cancer research and patient support foundation located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Target Cancer Foundation was founded through the experience of a rare cancer patient, uh, who happened to be my brother-in-law, Paul, uh, who passed away in 2009, but started the foundation himself based on his own experience facing a rare cancer called cholangiocarcinoma. In addition to my role at Target Cancer Foundation, I also serve on the board of directors of NORD, and I'm a founding co-chair of the NORD Rare Cancer Coalition. So on behalf of myself, NORD, and the Rare Cancer Coalition, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this webinar and for participating in this first Rare Cancer Day, which we're very excited about. The NORD Rare Cancer Coalition is a unified group of 24 rare cancer-focused NORD member organizations. The coalition was formed in 2017 to create a unified voice to raise awareness of rare cancers. And while the member organizations focus on many different areas, we're all committed to working together to address the challenges that are consistent among all rare cancers. And you'll be hearing about a lot of those on the webinar today. In a short time, the Rare Cancer Coalition is making a significant impact. We've developed a presence at major meetings such as ASCO and the NORD Summit, and we're raising awareness through our presence on panels both here in the U.S. and internationally. In addition, we're empowering our, our members by providing opportunities to collaborate, network, and share information. If there's anybody on the call who's interested in joining the coalition or learning more, please don't hesitate to reach out to me 
uh, or to John Hopper, who's co-chair of the Rare Cancer Coalition, or to the NORD team. And with that, I'm happy to turn the program over to Carol DeSantis, who's joining us today from the American Cancer Society. Thanks again. Hi, thanks. Yes, my name is Carol DeSantis, and as Katie mentioned, I'm an epidemiologist in the research department at the American Cancer Society. And I'm so glad to have a chance to speak with you all today and share some of my research on the important understudied topic of rare cancers. Some of you may be familiar with the American Cancer Society's Cancer Facts and Figures publications, which are produced by the Surveillance Research Group here at ACS. The main facts and figures is published every January and is most well known for the current year estimates of cases and deaths for about 50 cancer types. Each year the publication takes a deep dive into a timely topic of interest and in 2017 I led the report on rare cancers in adults. We focused on adults here because a few years earlier in 2014 the special, special section was on childhood and adolescent cancers and cancers that occur in children and adolescents are often quite different from those that are diagnosed in adults. While our facts and figures publications are geared toward a very broad audience, including policymakers, advocates, and the general public, each of our reports is accompanied by an article published in CA, a cancer journal for clinicians, for us to expand our reach to scientific and clinical audiences. But in order to provide a more comprehensive report on rare cancers, the companion article on rare cancers in the U.S. shown here on the right included patients of all ages, and it is this information that I'll be presenting today. Just to note, all of our facts and figures publications can be found on our website, cancer.org statistics. As many of you know, rare cancers present a number of unique challenges. One of these, in fact, is that there is not even a universally adopted definition for rare cancers, which can make things very complicated when you are trying to describe and research them. The U.S. Orphan Drug Act defines rare cancers as those that affect less than 200,000 people. And this is a definition based on cancer prevalence. That is the number of people alive that have been previously diagnosed with a rare cancer. On the other hand, the National Cancer Institute has defined rare cancers as those that are diagnosed in fewer than 15 people per 100,000 people per year. This is a definition based on incidents or new diagnoses each year. So these are very different definitions, and they've also used a definition of less than 40,000 diagnoses per year. But more recently, rare care, which is a consortium from the European Union whose initial aims were to describe the burden of rare cancers in Europe, define rare cancers as those that are diagnosed in fewer than six people out of every 100,000 people per year. In addition, this group, which included pathologists, hematologists, other clinicians, and epidemiologists, produced a list of clinically relevant rare cancers. And this is the framework that we used in our study of the rare cancer burden in the U.S. in order to be comparable to the work that had been published in other countries. So using this definition, we identified 181 different types of rare cancers in the U.S. that are perceived by clinicians as single diseases and that are relevant for clinical management and research. In fact, 119 of these are considered very rare in that they have an incidence rate of less than 0.5 cases per 100,000 people per year. Together, these rare cancers represent 20% or one out of every five cancers diagnosed in U.S. patients each year. In this study, we examine the distributions of rare and common cancers by a number of demographic characteristics. Let me pause for a moment and orient you to the next few slides. The blue shaded part of each row indicates the percent of diagnoses that are rare cancers, the green the percent that are more common cancers, and the gray part are for cancers that could not be classified either because of missing information um, or other reasons. So for example, in the first two rows, rare cancers account for about 21% of cancers diagnosed in males compared to 19% diagnosed in females. But the difference, differences by age are much more striking. Rare cancer types accounted for the majority of diagnoses uh, in children and adolescents, as well as about 40% of cancers diagnosed in young adults ages 20 to 39. By race and ethnicity, rare cancers account for a slightly larger proportion of cancers diagnosed in Hispanic, Latino, and Asian Pacific Islander populations. Notably, some cancers that are rare overall are more common in certain groups. 
For example, adenocarcinoma of the stomach is considered a rare cancer overall, but it is a common cancer among males as well as among Hispanic, Latina, and Asian Pacific Islander females. In our report, we provide incidence rates for each of the 181 rare cancer types by sex and race ethnicity. Now this figure shows the distribution of rare cancer diagnoses by major cancer site. Rare cancers account for about a third of cancers that occurred in the digestive system, which includes cancers in the oral cavity and pharynx, all of which are rare, the female genital system, and the hematopoietic system, which includes lymphomas and leukemias. In contrast, they account for only about 5 to 6 percent of cancers of the breast and male genital sites, as well as the urinary and endocrine systems. In part because rare cancers can be more challenging to diagnose, they are more often diagnosed at later stages. This slide shows the proportion of rare and common cancers that are diagnosed at late stages, which generally includes cancers that have spread to nearby lymph nodes or organs, as well as those that have already spread to distant sites or metastasized. Nearly 60% of rare cancers are diagnosed at advanced stages compared to 45% of more common cancers. However, stage of diagnosis does vary for specific cancers within these categories. For example, only 6% of soft tissue sarcomas of the skin and tubular carcinomas of the breast are diagnosed at advanced stages. On the other hand, more than 90% of mesothelioma of the pleura and pericardium, squamous cell carcinoma of the gallbladder, and Mullerian mixed tumors of the ovary are diagnosed at later stages. In part, due to this tendency to be diagnosed at more advanced stages, relative survival is poorer for patients diagnosed with rare cancers. I want to briefly point out that when I say relative survival, what I'm referring to is the percent of cancer patients alive after five years divided by the percent of patients of the same age, sex, race that would be expected to be alive after five years. So in this way, relative survival accounts for normal life expectancy. As a group, for patients diagnosed with rare cancers, the one-year survival is 76%, and the five-year survival is 57%, compared to one in five-year survival of 86 and 75%, respectively, for patients diagnosed with more common cancers. Importantly, there are substantial variations in survival by specific cancer types, as described in our study. For example, we found that one-year survival exceeded 90% for 72 rare cancers, including for patients diagnosed with many types of soft tissue sarcomas, classical and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, and uveal melanoma. In addition, there are many other factors that affect prognosis after a cancer diagnosis. For example, five-year survival for children and young adults diagnosed with a rare cancer is about 80%. And this is substantially higher than for older patients diagnosed with a rare cancer, for which survival is as low as 35% for those 80 and, in the 80 and older age group. It is also worth noting that in every age group, survival is higher for patients diagnosed with a more common cancer. In summary, any cancer diagnosis is difficult, but rare cancers can be especially and uniquely challenging for patients, their caregivers, and even clinicians. For many rare cancers, research to identify causes or develop strategies for early detection is extremely limited. Progress in screening has been largely limited to more common cancers in part because of the large number of patients that would be required to be screened to prevent one death, and as a result, Patients with a rare cancer often present with symptoms, which are, can be nonspecific. And therefore, rare cancers can be challenging for clinicians to diagnose, often resulting in numerous physician visits, misdiagnoses, and substantial delays in diagnosis. Treatment options for rare cancers are often more limited and less effective than for more common cancers, in part because clinical trials on rare cancers are inherently challenging. Research and resources have historically focused on the most common cancers, and thus development of new cancer therapies has lagged behind for rare cancers, with few exceptions. Notably, there has been tremendous success in the advancement of treatment for many, but not all, childhood cancers. One reason for this is because treatment for childhood cancers has been largely concentrated in specialized centers, and because of the joint research collaborations among these centers, which is a model for studying rare cancers. 
Finally, the number of rare cancers is likely to continue to increase due to the increased use of molecular markers in the classification of cancers. In other words, cancers are being more and more narrowly defined, so what was once considered one cancer like breast cancer is now known to consist of at least 21 different subtypes. Continued efforts are needed to develop interventions for prevention, early detection, and treatment to reduce the burden of rare cancers. In fact, research on rare cancers has led to the identification of numerous cancer genes and has increased our understanding of overall cancer biology. That's all for me today, but I do want to acknowledge my ACS colleagues and collaborators on this work, and I also just want to give one last plug for our website, where you can find additional information on our Cancer Facts and Figures special sections on childhood and adolescent cancers and rare cancers in adults. Also coming in 2020 is the sneak preview, but um, the special topic of our Cancer Facts and Figures will be cancers in adolescents and young adults. Thanks so much for your time, and I will pass it over to Kristen now. Hi, thank you, Carol. Um, I am Kristen Anthony, and I'm the president and founder of the P10 Hemeritoma Tumor Syndrome Foundation. What is P10 Hemeritoma Tumor Syndrome? P10 Hemeritoma Tumor Syndrome is a rare genetic condition that causes an increased risk for certain cancers, benign growth, and neuro neurodevelopmental conditions, and it affects the pro approximately 1 in 200,000 individuals. The cancer risks include breast, thyroid, kidney, colon, endometrial, and melanoma. And in the picture to the right, you can see um, some of our amazing community at our first ever international uh, P10 symposium, which we hosted. My motivation and, and what brought me into this space is I am personally affected like um, many who venture into the rare disease and rare cancer space. I am a now three-time cancer survivor. My diagnostic journey began um, after I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer at a young age and was having breast health issues. Uh, like many of us on, on the call who are in affected by a rare cancer or rare disease. Um, it was a bit of a journey when I brought it up to my physicians that maybe there was a correlation between uh, my breast health issues and having had thyroid cancer and was told, no, absolutely not. Uh, we're just going to treat this cancer and you'll be on your way. Fortunately, I persisted and um, didn't give up on my quest to, to get answers. I did online research and found a disease called Cowden syndrome, which is one of the presentations under the umbrella of P10 hemeritoma tumor syndrome. Uh, fortunately, we caught this disease early so that I can be proactive in screening and prevention of uh, cancers. Um, I was fortunate to have an incredible visit at the Cleveland Clinic, was impressed by the work that they do and asked how I could help and give back. The clinician giggled a bit and said, um, well, what we encourage our patients and our community to do is to go out and start great things. And thus, our foundation was born in 2013. Uh, due to the incredible growth of our foundation and our community, I left my career to run the foundation full time, initially as a volunteer. The picture to the right, you can see our second symposium, which was actually held at the Cleveland Clinic, which doubled in size year over year. I'm going to talk a little bit about the foundation um, successes and what we've been able to do thanks to a highly motivated community. As I mentioned, we had two incredibly successful scientific symposia. Uh, we also launched the first ever international um, patient-powered registry for patients with P10 hemeritoma tumor syndrome on Rare Disease Day 2019. At the time that I did this slide, we actually had 90 patients enrolled. Now we're at 167 patients, which is really incredible. We are working uh, within our foundation to begin a biobank of stem cell lines to support research um, and to give our, our research teams the tools necessary 
um, to do what they're doing. You can see in the slide to the right, or the picture to the right, I'm sorry, uh, we talk a little bit about our tool, toolbox approach with our Centers of Excellence program, uh, with our patient registry, with our meetings, and with our biobank. Um, within our Centers of Excellence program, we've had two to apply, the Cleveland Clinic and Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we're extremely excited about that. Another very exciting, uh, one of my favorite things that we've been able to do as a community through our International Family Council is we uh, launched our first Awareness Day and Awareness Month. Our Awareness Day is coming up on October 23rd. We also collectively came up with a worldwide advocacy campaign. You can find the page on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, at P10 Rocks Around the World. And you can see one of our um, precious patients there painting these beautiful rocks. And our rocks have been shared, um, impressively so, from the Alamo in Texas all the way to the Great Wall of China. Um, this quote really means a lot to me, and it was shared by one of our postdocs who's been incredibly supportive of uh, research in our disease space and of our patients. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. She asked me, if you were granted one wish, what would it be? And of course, for our patients, it would be a cure. Our focus is to collaborate with everyone. You're only successful when you band together as a community. Um, my advice to new organizations, um, you know, entering into this unknown territory is to remain steadfast. Never lose sight of why you began your journey, journey. And patients are at the center of everything we do. And I can truly say that, that our community um, is strong and resilient and absolutely amazing. And, and they're um, heroes of mine. And with that, I will introduce a, a new hero of mine and an incredible warrior. Um, Nicholas is absolutely amazing. Um, you guys are going to be so impressed with his story. Nicholas? Hi. Living with a rare disorder, I am Nicholas Wunderlach. I am 10 years old. I have neofibromatosis type 2. Neofibromatosis is a genetic disorder that causes tumors to grow on nerves in the body. One in 3,000 people have NF. NF2 is a more rare type and affects about 1 in 25,000 people. There is no cure for NF at this time. Living with NF2. My parents knew something was wrong on a ski trip when I was three. <laughs> my ski teacher couldn't get a ski boot on my left foot. It turns out I had a foot dropped on my left foot and couldn't put my toe in the air. It took a really long time for my parents to find out what was causing this problem. Living with NF2. Since I was diagnosed, I have been through a lot of medical stuff and have more to go. The summer before I started first grade, I had a tendon transfer to help my foot drop and surgery to reconstruct my left foot. Last summer, I had to have surgery to remove a tumor in my upper spine that was starting to impact my spinal cord. In August of this year, I had surgery to remove a tumor the in the cerebellum of my brain. This tumor turned out to be a grade three in the plastic and demona, which I can't even announce, which is a rare type of brain tumor. I am currently having daily proton beam radiation treatments for my brain tumor at MGH. I will have my fourth surgery after I finish radiation to remove a tumor in my shoulder, in my shoulder, shoulder that is causing weakness in my right hand and arm. 
A lot of people help me. My parents help me a lot with my NF2. They make sure that I see the best doctors to take good care of me. My teachers help me. They let me do my work from Boston. My extended family helps me. They take care of my sister and our dog while we are away and support us financially because this stuff is expensive. My friends at home help me. They are nice to me and keep me company on my Xbox while I'm in Boston. My friends Jack and Santiago carried my backpack at school last year for um, me for a month while I was recovering. My doctors helped me. They manage my case well and help maximize my quality of life. My doctors take good care of me. Dr. Ulrich at Boston Children's Hospital heads my medical care. She's kind of like a quarterback. Dr. Smith at Boston Children's is my neurosurgeon. He removed a tumor in my brain and spine and gave me an awesome mohawk haircut and tells bad jokes. Dr. Tarbell at MGH is heading my radiation. There are many other doctors, nurses, and assistants who also help me a lot. Challenges I face because of NF2 is so rare. Some things are difficult for me and people don't understand because they don't know about NF2. While other kids talk about baseball games and school performances, I usually talk about surgeries, MRIs, and anesthesia. Because NF2 is so rare, it is more difficult to find the great care I need. All of my doctors are in Boston. We now live in Arizona, but have been coming to Boston for about six years. Research funding is more limited because less people know about NF2. I don't know what my future holds. I like raising awareness. I learn about it. I talk about it. I wear the clothes. When people ask about it, it gives you a chance to educate them. BTF walks and other events raise awareness. I like to give free speeches on webin webinars. My NF2 and brain cancer are rare, but together we are not rare. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, this is John Hopper, and I am the co-chair of the Rare Cancer Coalition for NORD, along with my partner there, Jim Palma. Uh, I'm not sure how you follow somebody like Nicholas and Kristen. Their stories are amazing. They're powerful. Uh, and they give examples to all of us, I think, who are in the rare cancer world as to how we move forward with our organizations and our patient communities and our research communities. So Kristen and Nicholas, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Carol, thank you for all the statistics that you gave us also, which really brings it to life. So I am the president of the Fibrolamellar Cancer Foundation, which is one of the ultra rare cancers that Carol was talking about before. And uh, like people like Jim and others that I know are on the, this webinar here, we all know that the voice of a rare cancer, especially an ultra-rare cancer, uh, isn't heard loud enough. The phone doesn't ring every day for people just dying to help us out. We have to be outbound for that. And that's one of the reasons we, we started the Rare Cancer Coalition, again, bringing in unified voices, making ourselves heard, and making sure that those who need to hear us, the right ones that to need us here, the key stakeholders, do that. Uh, it's one of the reasons also that uh, I, along with people like Jim uh, and a few others, started the GI Cancer Alliance because if you look at the cancer that you have, you try to fit it into a larger group if possible so that your voice is heard amongst other cancers. So there's lots of ways to be able to approach how you can promote your own cancer foundation. And here we are on Rare Cancer Day. Uh, particularly here, what I'm going to show you is a couple of things that you can do to help promote Rare Cancer Day and your organization in particular. So the first slide here is the hashtag Rare Cancer Day. I encourage everyone who's listening to this to use that as much as possible. 
that will help to link to all the communications that are out there. And if you go to the uh, the website that we have here, the rarediseases.org, get involved, we're a cancer coalition, you can pick up some of the factoids that we have here, many of which Carol had mentioned. We also have banners for you. So uh, again, if you look at here, that's these are easy to put up on your website, to put on your Instagram, put on your Facebook page, etc. But importantly, again, it gets your voice heard so that you're not alone. What I have here is an example of what my organization did, and I'm sure others have done it too, but how do you combine your rare cancer with the strength of the Rare Cancer Coalition on a day like today? So here particularly, we're talking about what our foundation's all about. We're incorporating Rare Cancer Day. And we've even gone beyond that. So if you actually Googled Senator Richard Blumenthal today with Rare Cancer Day, you'll probably see a bunch of press releases out there because as a senior U.S. Senator, he is supporting this NORD effort quite a bit, recognizing that there is a need for increased f federal funding so we can find a cure for our cancer. We can get more clinical trials for our cancer. So we thank Senator Blumenthal's office for supporting this day. And again, if you Google that, I'm sure you'll see some of the quotes that he has out there today. So again, encouraging you all on this day, even though we have a few hours left, to do as much as you can to publicize this. Uh, again, this is Rare Cancer Day. Uh, the objectives, as we talked about before, is combining all the powers that we have to raise national awareness for, for diagnosis, for research, for patient connections to, and isolations. And as I mentioned before, use all the tools that you have, your Facebook Live, this Rare Cancer webinar, the social media toolkit, which is on that URL that I mentioned before, and all the infographics and banners and logos that we have here. You know, together again, we can be loud. Uh, this day, we hope, is going to be an annual day. Uh, might even extend beyond just a day, hopefully. We'll see how kind of what kind of reaction we get from all of you. But again, the importance here is for all of us to rally together and to have a loud voice to get more aggressive and more solutions to our rare cancers here. So with that in mind, I'm actually going to switch this back over to Katie who's going to take questions and answers. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, so thank you for your presentations, Jim, John, Carol, Kristen, and Nicholas. It's, it's really great for us to hear all of your different perspectives. So we've been collecting questions from participants during the webinar, and we're going to move to a question and answer session. Uh, the team's going to try to answer as many of your questions as possible, but we may not be able to answer all of them. And I just want to uh, make a note that we've received a lot of um, very specific medical questions. And since our speakers today are not clinicians, um, we'd love to help, but we won't be able to address um, all of those. So my first question I'm going to ask to Nicholas. Um, so the question, Nicholas, is have you met any other kids with rare cancers? And what would your advice to another rare cancer patient be? I have met other kids with NS2. It's good to find people that understand me. Doing the CTF walks helped me with finding friends like me. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Nicholas. And I also want to tell you that you're getting all kinds of compliments from our audience members. They loved your talk. <laughs> um, and let me follow that. Actually, um, Chris, and I have a question that's sort of similar, and I think since you've um, experienced rare cancer, um, here's the question. From your experience, what would you say or share with somebody newly diagnosed with a rare cancer? Um, I would say while it's scary and overwhelming that they're not alone, um, seek community uh, because there is uh, comfort uh, in knowing that there are people that understand exactly where you are um, and what your fears are and what the highs and lows can be. But most importantly, you're, you're not alone. There are others out there. 
Yeah, and I think that's such an important message. I've heard so many people say they're so uplifted, um, you know, when they find somebody to support them. And so that's some of the great work that all the different foundations and patient advocacy groups are doing. Um, next, I think uh, maybe Jim or John, you can um, take this, but um, how can people find the right doctors and how can people find clinical trials for rare cancers? Jim, you want to go first? Uh Sure, sure. I'll start. Um, and and you know, it's a great question. And and I think actually, a uh, the the organizations that are on this call are often the best source for that. So there's a lot of advocacy organizations that are dedicated to specific rare cancers. And and those organizations and the patients that they work with are the world's experts on these diseases. So. Um, really connecting with a patient advocacy organization that represents the type of rare cancer that you're facing um, can be an incredibly important step towards identifying centers of excellence, um, doctors who specialize in a particular rare cancer, and especially clinical trials, which often in rare cancers offer uh, uh, an incredibly important chance at treatment uh, versus the standard of care. So I'll just add to that. So go to clinicaltrials.gov, and you'll see clinical trials that are listed for your cancer. You just put in the search tool what your, the cancer that you're looking for. So that's also very important. As Jim said, many of the specific cancer websites will have a locator for um, treatment centers and physicians, et cetera, on it. Uh, the other group never to overlook is the National Cancer Institutes. While they may be also noted on individual websites or clinicaltrials.gov, uh, having a relationship with them, it's free for everyone here. We're taxpayers, and a lot of people forget that. They do treat, they do clinical trials. Uh, I would definitely check in with them also. Great. No, thank you. That's really useful information. And you've just given us a lot of great resources. Um, other people are asking about resources available to help. Does anybody have any other resources for rare cancer patients they'd like to recommend? Okay. Well, um, so the next one, um, one of our participants is asking if somebody could elaborate more on the use of a biobank. Um, hi, this is Kristen. I'm not sure if that question was uh, directed to me since, since I spoke on that, but we are in the process of uh, building ours now. We're collaborating with a uh, local university researcher. We're going to start small and then build from there and add the protocol for that to our current registry protocol. Um, I, one of our researchers at a center shared with me that um, using biomaterials for clinical purposes versus research purposes um, can be a definite issue at large academic centers. So we see this as an opportunity to, to provide one additional tool um, for our research teams um, available to everybody with the protocol going through a process set up by our foundation. I hope that helps, but if you have any other questions, um, I'm happy to talk with whomever offline. Yeah, no, that's very helpful, Chris. And then just a, a follow-up, are you working with any other groups in any other countries? Um, yes, actually one of uh, the individuals that I collaborate with quite frequently, Claudio OS, is on, he's in Italy, and he is, I think, listening to the call. He and I um, uh, both share the, the mantra that you, a collaboration is the only way. So we both um, are working on our patient registry currently. They, he got ethics approval in Italy, and they're building out um, all of the surveys and necessary materials in Italian, which has really been, you know, an amazing patient-centered collaborative uh, effort. Um, and we, we intend on continuing that going forward and also collaborating, collaborating with other new organizations in our space um, that, are, that are being formed and um, starting as we speak. 
Yeah, oh, no, that's, that's inspirational and, and great to hear, and uh, coming together and collaborating is, is really the answer. So, no, thank you. Um, I have a question. This might be a good one for Carol. Um, it said, are there commonalities that rare cancers share, and are there certain demographics or groups of people that are affected by rare cancers? Um, you know, I mean, I, some of the data that I showed, we did look at that. Um, you know, I, I think there's some usefulness in combining rare cancers together and looking at them, um, especially for advocacy and, and general things like that. But I also think, um, you know, each each cancer type is unique, um, and and so you can't lump them together too much. But certainly um, cancers that occur in younger people, um, you know, are m much more often the rare cancers. Um, so, uh, you know, I hope I answered your question. And those uh, resources um, that I pointed to on our website, cancer.org slash statistics, also um, provides more information um, as well. Great. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have a couple people here who want to be activists and, and help. So um, let me read one of their questions. It says, how can I make a difference in my area to let people know about rare cancers? We were hit by this recently and did not have a good outcome. But being on the group site gave me so much information. I want people to know there's hope. So if people want to become active and they want to do more to help and advocate for rare cancers, um, and, and I'll just put this out to the group, um, you know, how can they become more involved? I'll give it a shot here. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can do that. Again, if you're not affiliated with a foundation or a patient advocacy group, certainly look for that first and get in contact with that organization. There's always volunteer opportunities within those along the way. Uh, the other way that you can get involved certainly is just being an advocate within your own local media, and even your own local hospitals, et cetera. Uh, if you are continuing to try to use the NORD name, that will give you certainly great recognition. I'd say the staff at NORD also is particularly experience at helping people who want to be mobilized in the area of helping whatever individual cancer you have, how to do that. So I always look at that and say, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's been done. It's been done successfully by a bunch of groups. Use the resources at NORD, I would say, to certainly find ways that you can be uh, in the front line, if that's what you want, or behind the scenes and helping out, even in things such as social media, to get the word out about your particular disease, there's always a need to have that going on consistently. So those are a couple of suggestions I would have. Yeah, no, that's terrific. And yes, thank you. We here at NORD are here to help however we can um, and appreciate you providing those, those different tips. Um, here I have one. It says, how can research provide clinicians with the information that they need to better support patients. So anybody have any ideas there? How can research provide clinicians with information they need to better support patients? Hi, this is um, Kristen again. So let me make sure I understand the question. How can we provide information to uh, clinicians about how to better support patients, is that right? No, I, I think, Kristen, it's, it's um, you know, how can research results and research findings um, inform clinicians and help them to support patients? Gotcha. Hi, it's Carol. So, I mean, I think, like, part of our intention, as I was mentioning with our article in the CA journal, which is focused to clinicians, is just to educate clinicians um, as much as possible. I mean, there's, there's just inherent challenges, you know, when someone presents with symptoms. You know, until there's enough research to be able to identify something with some simple test. I mean, that's 
way further, or maybe not way further down the road. I mean, there are people that are probably working on that. But I think the most important thing is just to um, provide education and awareness. Yeah. Hi, this well, is Jim, and, and I, re I agree with that. And, and we we'll just add, you know, I, I think one of the things that really can serve as an impediment to progress in developing effective treatments for rare cancers is just a lack of research and research tools. So um, as advocates, we, we can really do a lot, not only by raising awareness of rare cancers, but also as being research advocates, um, helping organizations that fundraise towards research and, and helping to, to make sure that dollars are going in the direction of rare cancers as well as more common cancers. Because when the data is generated, when publications come out, uh, clinical trials follow and doctors take notice. So it's, it really is important that we play a role in advocating not only for awareness, but for research as well. No, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's great. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, Nicholas, I'm going to send another question your way. We have um, people curious if there are things that you, make you feel better when you're undergoing your treatment. So are there any things that you like to do or that kind of help you to feel better while you're um, undergoing treatment for your cancer? Well, I like to play on my Xbox, and that helps me, and also playing with my special bear. Oh, <laughs> so uh, oh, what then? What what what's your bear look like? He's beat up, kind of, <laughs> and he's brown. Oh, uh, well, those are the best kind of bears. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Nicholas. Um, another question from the audience, um, how can I get involved advocating for rare cancer drug development? Anybody have any thoughts there? Hi, this is Jim. So there, there are a lot of ways, and often this does come through partnerships with advocacy organizations, but one way that I know um, a lot of advocates and patients especially can help is by um, actually meeting with companies and serving on advisory boards for companies. Um, the, the patient voice is incredibly important um, as drugs are being developed, and it's something that's, that's taken very seriously. So um, that's something that, you know, I think the coalition can definitely help to develop some tools on, and, and we're trying to, to create some educational materials around for the coalition as a whole. So hopefully more to come on that, but um, definitely happy to talk more about that um, after the webinar if anybody would like to. Oh, no, great. That, that's great. Um, so another question um, uh, from the audience, do any rare cancer organizations or leaders have any tips on off-label insurance approval? So uh, I'll repeat, do any other, um, any rare cancer organizations or leaders have any helpful tips on off-label insurance approval? So I don't know if that's something you've encountered in your experience, but um, Thought I'd put that out there. Okay, so maybe maybe not at this time. We'll try to get back to the um, to the per to the person who sent that. Um, well, I guess we're we're getting close to the end of our time, and so you know maybe we could go around um, and have each of you talk about what Rare Cancer Day means to you. Um, this is an exciting event. It's the first Rare Cancer Day put together by the Rare Cancer Coalition. Um, you know, Rare Cancer is uh, at the heart of, 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 of m most of your work or, or what's impacting your lives. So, um, Jim, maybe I can start with you and to say what does uh, Rare Cancer Day mean to you? Sure, and, and just thank you again to everybody for joining, um, and thank you to Nord for coordinating this. Um, you know, as I think about Rare Cancer Day and what it means, I, I just, I'm, I'm incredibly excited. Um, this is the first time we've done this, and the response that we've gotten, not only on, on just this, this one event, this webinar, but on social media all day and from people who have been reaching out has really been amazing. So um, while, while Rare Cancer is individually 
you know, certainly may not represent huge numbers of people collectively, uh, we really do represent a, a huge, a huge number of people. Um, and by coming together, I think we can do a lot to, to raise awareness. And I, and I think, you know, awareness can be a very broad and general term, but in this case, we know that the, the experience of facing a rare cancer is not necessarily the same as the experience of facing a common cancer. Uh, and, and usually people don't know that until they're faced with a rare cancer themselves or if they're impacted uh, through a family member. So I think as we get the word out, we can really help to change the perception and help people to understand the needs and the challenges of, of researchers and patients and families. Um, and by doing so, we can really make a difference. So, so thank you again. Oh, no, that's really great comments. Thank you, Jim. Um, John, what does Rare Cancer Day mean to you? I tell you, it's a fantastic opportunity to bring rare cancer to the forefront, especially for the key influencers. You know, I was amazed when I went out to see Senator Blumenthal two weeks ago with Nord's Rachel Shearer, and the welcome that we got, the support, that we got, and then later on met with several U.S. congressmen, uh, was to me uh, refreshing, hopeful, and an area where I say we actually need to tap into more often. So I look at this by actually having an anchor day annually, and perhaps in the future, perhaps with even more lead time and more things before the actual Rare Cancer Day, there's a lot we can get through. And again, just hearing those people on the Hill talk about the need for more government funding certainly rings true to all of our ears. So I look at this as being a unique opportunity to bring it to the forefront for those who can really make a difference. No, that's great, John. And hopefully this is just the very beginning. <laughs> So, um, Carol, any thoughts on Rare Cancer Day and what it means to you? Sure. Well, uh, so I was in the middle of working on this report when my brother-in-law was diagnosed with a soft tissue sarcoma, and you know, it took over a year for him um, from the onset of symptoms to be diagnosed. So even though he had myself and I had many people as resources um, to get information and to push for answers, um, it still like took was such a difficult process, um, as I'm sure many on the call um, have experienced. So um, it just really pushes me to understand um, kind of the need for support for for patients and the need for people to understand to be their own advocates um, in in the healthcare system with their doctors if they have symptoms to keep pushing to find out what's going on. So yeah, this is personal for me as well, and um, I think it's important to uh, to do more research and to get this out there and to um, just shine a light here. Thanks. Well, well, that's great, and thank you for uh, sharing your personal story. I hope your brother's doing well, and um, yeah. <laughs> so Kristen, thoughts from you? What does Rare Cancer Day mean to you? Um, absolutely. So for, for Rare Cancer Day, I think about um, my mantra, which is raising awareness is one step closer to a treatment or cure. And um, it's very important to, to us and our community to make sure people get an early diagnosis. And in my own family, we have three generations, none of whom were initially diagnosed in a clinic. Uh, unfortunately, my mom um, uh, passed away with her third cancer, never knowing that she actually had the same mutation that I had. So if we can make a difference uh, for a family with an early diagnosis by raising awareness and then using that awareness um, to help researchers uh, with funding and moving closer to treatment, then that is everything. Yeah, that you know, it, it it really is, and you know, it every rare cancer is rare, but then you start to talk to people, and you find more and more people who have had this impacting their own lives. Um, you know, I'd like to ask this question also to the audience. If anybody wants to write in and say what Rare Cancer Day means to them, we'll be thrilled to read it um, on this webinar. 
And, you know, Nicholas, a lot of times they save the, the last word for the star of the show, so I'm coming to you last to see um, what Rare Cancer Day means to you. Rare Cancer Day is a day for other kids like me to feel special and not alone. Thank you for having me. Oh, that's great. And you sure are special, Nicholas. We're, we thank you for being here. And I want to thank everybody, uh, John, Jim, Carol, Kristen, Nicholas. Um, it, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really been a motivational um, experience listening to all of your stories. And, and Nicholas, I know everybody on this webinar wants to wish you and your family well, so you keep up the fight and, and hang in there. And thank you um, to the Rare Cancer Coalition for the amazing role they're playing to raise awareness and support for rare cancers. So if anybody has a question that was not answered today or a suggestion for a future webinar topic, please feel free to email us at education at rarediseases.org and someone on our staff will follow up with you. And after this webinar, you're going to receive a short survey, so we encourage you to complete it because it will help us to develop our future webinars. So thank you so much for joining us. Everybody go out, post on social media about Rare Cancer and Rare Cancer Day awareness, hashtag Rare Cancer Day, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.